love. I guess we'll start now. Um, so I'm, I'm Professor Pete Kosek. I'm one of the honors faculty here. I'm a math professor here. I'm also the faculty athletic representative, so I do eligibility, so some of you I've worked with with that. Um, and so this kind of hits a, a really sweet spot of my kind of areas of expertise is athletics as well as math. So we're going to talk about some bracketology. Um, so just a little summary in case just get us all thinking about this. This happens next week. 68 teams are going to be selected. When? Anyone know when the selection was Sunday. Sunday, Selection Sunday, right? So on Sunday, we'll have the 68 teams be selected. And then of those 68 teams, um, okay, um, eight of the teams will compete in playing games to be seeded into the 64 teams. So you think about this being the normal tournament of 64 teams. Um, four teams will be eliminated before the tournament really starts. You fill out brackets. You predict what teams will win, progress through the tournaments. I'm assuming that you guys kind of have some familiarity with the, the NCAA tournament. Uh, if you don't, this is gonna be real crazy. But um, it's just like, hopefully you've seen the brackets and you kind of know what we're talking about. Um, so how many different brackets are there? Um, anyone know, is this nine, what is this? Million, billion, trillion? Anyone know what this is? Nine quintillion, nine quint over nine quintillion different brackets that exist. And so I remember when I was in high school, my friends and I used to love doing um, brackets. And we were like, why don't we just have a computer just do every single possible bracket, and then we'll be able to have a perfect bracket. Um, to put some insight into that, this number, if you had a, a computer that hypothetically could do one trillion brackets per second, no computer could actually do that. But hypothetically, if you could, it would take a computer over 292 years to create all of these brackets. So that's the hard part about picking brackets is that there's so many different possibilities. So because of that, some people have offered up to a billion dollars for a perfect bracket. That was many years ago. I think it was Warren Buffett offered a billion dollars. Since then, he hasn't done that, which I'm bummed about, but um, there's a lot of different awards for it. A perfect bracket's never happened, at least one that's verifiable. Yeah, maybe someone's like, I have a perfect bracket at home, but no one actually knows that that was filled in before the game started. And I'm not gonna help you make a perfect bracket, I'll be honest. Um, it, uh, there's so much luck that's associated with this. Um, my goal is to help you create better brackets than you have been creating. And um, just also, when it comes to scoring of these bracket competitions, most bracket competitions, they weigh each round equally. Um, so later, games later on in the tournament are more important than the previous round. So look at like ESPN. ESPN has, I think, 320 points for each round. If you pick uh, in the first round when there's 64 teams, you'll get 10 points for every correct game. So that gives you a total first round points of 320 for all 32 games. If you look at the, the championship game, that's worth 320 points by itself. So it's better for you to pick the champion than it is to try to pick some crazy upsets early on and then maybe take out teams that easily could be champions. So that's an important thing if you think about strategizing for most success. So, all right, so let's see, how do we improve by kicking some butt? So let's talk about, first thing I want to talk about is perception rankings. Um, only two of these have been good indicators for success in the tournament. Anybody know, what do I mean by perception rankings? Anyone know what's an example of a perception ranking? If we talk about, say, women's basketball, women's basketball was ranked what in the country? Anyone know what our women's basketball team was ranked in the country? 20 something, yeah. Um, how, how are how they ranked 20th? Who, who decided they were ranked 20, 20th in the country? Base, bunch of people, right? Th their perception, they said, okay, yeah, I think Sterling's the 20th best team in the country. Um, that's a perception ranking. It's just simply a bunch of people who kind of have some ideas. Maybe they use statistics, that's fine, but they're coming up from people's perceptions is how these rankings um, have been created, but only two, I'll talk about these two in a little bit, have been good indicators for success in the tournament. Computer ranking systems, I'll spend quite a bit of time on that because I think that's unfamiliar to many of you. Uh, linear regression in the four-factor model, again, that's a big one. And then the last one, computer simulations, this requires computer programming skills. I won't talk too much about it, but I'll just do one slide in case you do know computer programming. It's a cool application of that. So let's talk about perception rankings. 
So of these two, the only two that have really shown to be statistically better than other ones in trying to create um, brackets. The first one is the preseason AP polls and preseason coaches polls. Um, this is usually the, the standard way that if you think about a team being ranked first or second in the nation, it's usually ranked by the AP polls and the coaches polls. But it's not the AP polls and coaches polls that are at the end of the season. Those are actually not very good indicators. Instead, the preseason polls are actually better than these later season polls. Um, but we have to be aware of injuries. Anybody know why? What's the, what are people basing preseason polls on? What are we basing preseason rankings? If you've played no games, what are you ranking teams based off of? What was it? Previous years? Kind of, a little bit. But a lot of it is basically what, what's the best that this team could perform at? What do we think that the, the maximum capabilities our team, these teams could have? So just based on who's on the team, what type of success they've had in the past, what type of programs, etc., what's the best that this, these people can perform? They've seen no basketball games at this point in the season. So in the tournament, usually these teams that just have this innate abilities of saying, I have really good quality players, these, these end up doing better than later on when we've seen lots of ups and downs throughout the season. It creates too much noise in our data. And so these preseason ones are actually pretty good. But again, injuries can completely tank that. You might be ranked number one, your top three players are all injured, you're not gonna do very well in the tournament. And then the other one is the NCAA rankings of the 6-8 teams, i.e. the seeding. So if you do the most boring bracket ever of do one seeds, two seeds, win, three seeds, all of that, and you just go down until the final four is all number one seeds, and then you have um, whatever the, the top two were and then the top one, that's actually a really good way to fill out a bracket. Not very fun, but it is a very, um, it's better than most perception rankings. And so, but in general, though, these are actually not very good indicators. So the, these are the two best, but they're often not very good indicators of success. Why? What's an why, why do we think that these perception rankings kind of break down when we think about the NCAA tournament? I don't even know why. If we're just having, say, coaches or people watching some games, why does this not really lead to a lot of success? Okay, and so in particular, who would probably be selected more often than others in these? Who usually gets ranked higher than other teams in college rankings? Anybody know? So a lot of really big schools. So you go to some of the places like, like the Big Ten, the SEC, a lot of these people will be ranked higher than those from the smaller conferences that people don't pay attention to as much. The problem is, is that these perception rankings, nobody can tell you how good St. Peter's is. Nobody's been watching all of St. Peter's games, most likely. No one's been watching all of, um, I don't know, Indiana University or something, right? So all of these small schools that sometimes make these Cinderella runs, no one's following them. No one's really watching them. You're watching all of these big conferences, top schools from them. And so we end up not getting very accurate rankings because these usually only rank the top 20 some teams, but we know there's 68 teams that are gonna be selected into this tournament. And so just to give you a little insight, um, so I think I on that, the, what, I think the first link that I have on Canvas sends you to the, the preseason basketball rankings. So if you want to access these, you can go on ESPN. We see on here, there's quite a bit of um, similarity between uh, these, these two AP Top 25 and coaches polls. Usually AP Top 25 is the one that most people use. Um, we see that you know UNC, Gonzaga, Houston, et cetera, KU, I know there's quite a few KU fans here. Um, you guys were number five previously. And so again, if you're using this, say, oh, okay, maybe some place like Tennessee, you were ranked pretty good in the preseason and you're still ranked pretty well now, you might have a pretty decent talent pool on your team. So that's perception rankings. So then we're gonna move on to computer ranking systems. And so these are usually outperforming most perception banks, right? Rankings, because you can look at all of the teams in the NCAA Division I with an unbiased manner. You're not gonna pick these big schools and have this bias of big schools play big schools, so they're gonna be better than these smaller schools. 
There's a lot of these. There is a ton of computer ranking systems out there that all have a slightly different flavor as to how they determine rankings. And so they incorporate either something like wins, margin of victory, strength of schedule, home versus away success. They usually do not take into account statistics of win, or not win, um, like points scored, assists, any of that. They just kind of keep big picture. And all of these are gonna take some things like wins, margin of victory, et cetera, and then do some sort of computations that they have information from all the teams in the NCAA Division I, and they spit out some sort of ranking from these. And how they do that, there's usually a giant system of equations, and they solve this giant system of equations, so if you want to take linear algebra with me, I'll talk about that um, at this point. Just very, uh, I'll do like, like a day on this to see just a little bit of how you can do, how things like college algebra can actually help you create these ranking systems. So I have, I think the, the, next, uh, the next link that's on Canvas is going to send you to, I think it's called, what are they called, Mastery Ratings, I think. There's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of these computer ranking systems. So go ahead, go to the, go to the, the next, uh, next link that I have on there. It should send you to this website. This is the College Basketball Ranking Composite. There's 65 different ones that are currently being used. This, this Massey website, um, it has its own ranking system, the Massey ratings, they're really cool. The NAIA also has some of these too, so you can delve into Massey ratings afterwards. But these, um, this whole collection of them are going to be your computer ranking systems that are currently being published. Right before the tournament, a few more up here. But if you click on some of these red ones, it'll send you to what the website is with those ranking systems. So I'll talk about some of these in a little bit, but if you wanna go delve into this Pomeroy one, you can click on the link, go to the website, and you'll see what that is. But what this site does is it shows you on all of these, these different columns, this WMV one, that's the Wobus Small, whatever. WLK is Whitlock, BWE is B. Wilson, Empirical, et cetera. They have all of these. And so what this shows you in one glance is Houston is ranked number two from this one, but one in a bunch of these other ones. And then there's over here SPR. This is highlighted in blue. What that means is this is the computer ranking system that has Houston being ranked the lowest. And then et cetera. You can go see that Alabama has a bunch of twos, some ones thrown in there, UCLA, et cetera. And then you, you can continue down, you can see all of these different schools and how they're ranked with all of these at once. So I wanna highlight some of the top predictive ones. You can have computer ranking systems that are really good at describing what has been done in the season, but in the tournament, we wanna know what will happen. Now, all of these things are still gonna be wrong, but these are the top ones historically in the past few years that have been better than other ones. So there's this, this Pomeroy one I just mentioned, Ken Palm, um, that's a great one. Sagarin, um, this is also used by USA Today. Team Rankings Pred, Inc. Stats, Dr. Entropy, LRMC, and ESPN BPI. So the ESPN BPI is actually done by ESPN. Again, you can go to all of these. Other ones are great too, but you can check out these to see how the teams are being ranked. And so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna kind of highlight some of these, but be aware that all of these have some secret or proprietary calculations. We can't know exactly how these are done because you know, they often make money based on some of these or you just wanna keep them a, a secret. Um, so let's try to understand a couple of these to see how these computer ranking systems should work for us. So the Ken Palm ranking. So I think the, the next link on Canvas should send you to Ken Palm rankings um, or also Pomeroy as well. Uh, I'll show real quick. Um, so this is so if you go to the link, this is what it should pop up as um, this 2023 Pomeroy College Basketball ratings. Um, you get a, a whole slew of these. I'll unpack this a little bit. So this is um, it's designed to calculate the adjusted offensive defensive efficiency and give a number of points allowed, points scored, points allowed per 100 possessions. So we're trying to basically normalize this. These, these numbers to say, on average, if you have 100 possessions, how efficient is your offense versus defense with how many points you're going to be scoring versus being allowed? And so why is that 
a useful ranking tool, why is it helpful to be able to say if everyone's normalized to say, given 100 possessions, how many points scored versus points allowed, why would that be useful to help us rank things for the tournament? Do you know why that's useful? If we could, because we know some teams play faster than other teams. Some teams will have more possessions than other teams. But why is it useful then to say, what if everybody had the same possessions and we ignore how fast or how slow we play? Well, so just arrow the ball. So what are you, like, are you scoring almost every possession that you can get? Or Ex are you not? Exactly, right? So, so we just look to say, okay, if you have this possession, are you scoring or not? And then in a game, two teams will have the same number of possessions. And so we don't have to, the pace of the game will force both teams to play at that pace. So if we can just know, if everyone has the same pace, who's scoring the most points, who's making the most of their possessions. Also, um, this there also includes a luck element, a strength of schedule component. And so if we look at this, again, they have things like, there's this little luck component. They have these ratings and then there's a rank. These are like the ranks of them. So we have, this is your uh, adjusted EDM. This is usually the, um, the, the overall rank, uh, the overall rating that we're using to determine our rankings. And then they break it up into offensive and defensive. So we see something like Houston. Houston has the fifth best offense based on this calculation. They have the sixth best defense. Go down to someone like Tennessee, their tennis, their defense is the best in the country, but their offense is 40, or their, their offense is 48th. Flip that over to Gonzaga, where Gonzaga has the best offense, but the 74th worst defense. And so we can kind of somewhat predict what's gonna happen in some of these games. You know, something like Gonzaga is going to probably be in a, a sprint match with somebody by scoring lots and lots of points, and they're going to be giving up lots and lots of points. So their hope is that they can outpace somebody else. And then you can delve more into some of these, like the strength of schedule. You can see how well was the offense the, the team played versus their defense, etc. But this is really great. Um, but make note, you have the ranking over there, and then you have these ratings, this adjusted EDM. That's this ranking value. Uh, ink stats. So the, the next link on Canvas sends you to this website on ink stats. Um, website should look like this. Um, and so again, we're going to have, if, if you can pull this up, you can see some of these specific informations. Not as tiny. So this, um, this predictive rating corresponds to the number of points better a team is than the average team. So what do I mean by this predictive rating? Um, that's um, this is this is this column, and so this is again this is what's dictating the the ranking is what this rating number is going to be, and so what this says is Houston is going to be 19.4 points better than the average team. If you scroll down all the way to see all I think 363 NCAA Division One schools, there's a bunch of negatives that you're going to be below average for some of those. Then if you compare two of these teams' predictive ratings, the difference between these numbers is the expected scoring margin, margin at a neutral location. Now with the NCAA tournament, you do have neutral location, so this is useful. You can see that this specific rating corresponds to a score difference. And when we looked at some of these, these numbers, notice Houston's 19.4, Alabama's 19.0. It's a very tiny margin, but on average, you would expect Houston to beat Alabama by a half a point. So if you play many, many, many times, you average out this, the difference between these two teams, you'll get roughly a half a point difference between those. So, um, so then uh, the pace, similar to the, the Ken Palm ones, there's a pace component. The pace is the number of possessions the team has in a game. Um, and so we can ask the question, what are some pros and cons of faster paced teams versus slower paced teams? Because if, if pace is something that they're using to help indicate this information, why? What are some pros and cons of faster paced teams versus slower paced teams? Anybody know what's an advantage of either being faster paced or slower paced? Anybody know, in particular, what's a disadvantage of being a slower paced team in an NCAA tournament? know what's so maybe dangerous about that? Unless things are faster paced, but you're also like virtually your possessions pretty much. Because if you're a, a 
chiropractic too, a lot of people have like chiropractic. However, like at the same time, like the amount of time you have your ball for it is like also can be lower. Like one possession can be a lower amount of time than another possession too. However, yeah. Exactly, right. So you'll have the ball a little bit less, but you'll get a lot more opportunities to score. And so with these teams that have faster pace, faster pacing to them, if you have a few missed shots, it's not that big of a deal because you have lots and lots and lots of possessions that you keep wanting to just pump out shot after shot after shot, and you're gonna be able to have, if you're the better team, more opportunities to make sure that you win. As opposed to slower paced teams, the danger is, is that if you just miss a few shots, there's not that many possessions you have in the game. And so this, the slower paced team, um, anybody know what the, the biggest upset of all time in the NCAA tournament has been? I know. There was a 16 seed that beat a number one seed. Um, UMBC many years ago beat Virginia. This is a perfect example. Virginia was a very slow paced team. Virginia started to not play extremely well, but because they started missing some shots and UMBC just started draining some threes, then UMBC was able to beat them because they just didn't have enough opportunities for UMBC to actually start shooting based upon what their team should be shooting. Like, the, the, their shooting percentage should not have been as high as it was, but when you have few opportunities, you can get lucky sometimes. And so luck plays a bigger fact with slower, slower paced teams. And then this last thing on the ink stats, um, this EPR, it's the very last column. This is the expected <coughs> rating. Um, this is uh, a rating that a team would need to have in order to win the same number of games they won. So if, if they won 21 games, what would be, what's the expected rating that you would need to be able to win 21 games? And so something to take note of, this EPR, if it's lower than their actual predictive rating, they may not be as good of a team as they seem, or they also had a very easy schedule that anybody could have maybe had as many wins as they had. So we can somewhat use that, but um, if, if you look at this one in particular, this is often how they, they'll use EPR quite a bit to determine seeds, but they still do their own rankings based on this predictive ratings. So then uh, the LRMC one, I have a big, I'm a big fan of this one because it stands for Logistic Regression Markov Chains. These are mathematical processes. I don't expect many of you to know any of these words, but um, you can model a lot of things using logistic regression. It's kind of like linear regression, if that word, um, if you heard that word before. And Markov chains, not even gonna try to explain that, but super mathematical, big fan of this one. Um, again, if you take linear algebra, we talk about Markov chains in that class. Um, but one, one downfall about this LRMC one, so you can go to the, the link, there's another link on Canvas that sends you to this page. What you'll see is that this ranking system only supplies a ranking and not a rating. And so I'm gonna talk a little about what, what the difference between that is. So what's the difference between a ranking and a rating? So a ranking says you are ranked one, two, three, et cetera, but a rating were those weird decimal numbers that we often got that was used to determine what our rank would be. So again, this is what the website should be. You see there's the LRMC rank on the left-hand side. So like UCLA's number one, then Houston's two, et cetera. But no place do you see how those ranks are calculated. We can't see these numbers to know what's the difference between a team that's ranked one versus a team that's ranked two versus a team that's ranked three. It's just, it's just one is better than two, which is better than three. We don't know what the difference is between these. As opposed to the other ones, like the Ken Palm one or the Ink Stats, we could see that, you know, in the Ink Stats one, 19.4 was the top rating, and then 19.0 was the next one. And then I think it jumped down a little bit more. So you can see that one and two were kind of closer than maybe two and three were. And so why does that make a difference for us? What is the difference between rankings and ratings? And so what rankings are, so ranking the team first, second, third, fourth, et cetera, this is an example we call ordinal level data. So if you've taken statistics with me, You've, you've heard this phrase before. What the, what the ordinal level data, what that means is that there is a ranking. There is first, second, third, fourth, et cetera, but there's not precise differences. We don't know what the difference is between a team ranked third and ranked fourth. And so the problem is, is that you can't calculate a meaningful average of rankings because the difference, the gap between say a third and fourth ranked team in one system might have a larger gap than third and fourth. 
So we can't view third rank the same as a fourth rank, or third rank in one system the same as a third rank in another system. So we're, we're kind of restricted when we look at this level data. But ratings are a little bit higher of a level of data. Their example is what we call interval level data, where there is going to be some precise differences. And so you can do computations with ratings. You could do average ratings across the board. You could do um, uh, medians, means, all sorts of things. We can do lots of computations. So I wanna go through one computation that's really useful. Because when we have lots of rating systems, we'd like to be able to combine them. And so the challenge is, is that if we have some ratings that maybe rank things between 21 to negative 21, so this is something like ink stats, most of their ratings fall between 21 and negative 21. Things like Ken Palm, the Pomeroy ones, are gonna be more between 100 and negative 100. How can we make comparisons between these if you're say a 19.4 and one, and then the other one you're like a 98, or maybe you're a 78. How do you know to combine these two very different scales with one another? And so we use a calculation that's called Z-scores. So if you've taken a statistics class, hopefully you've seen Z-scores before. Um, if not, I'll give you a quick rundown on this. Uh, but basically what a Z-score is, is it tells you how much above or below average a team is. So when you look at something like a scale between 21 to negative 21, or 100 versus negative 100, you could say, on average, this is the average rating that we have, how much above average are you based upon how much of a spread there is with our data, without, with these ratings? And so Z-scores tells basically how much above or below average, and they also normalize the ratings. So what happens is we basically squeeze all of these ratings, say between all of these, will be the squeeze between four and negative four. Most of them are between three and negative three. There's a a statistical result, like roughly 99.7% of the data will fall between three and negative three. Um, but this is how we could squeeze everybody into some small window that, that we can combine these different rating systems. So I have um, the, the next sheet, uh, the next thing on Canvas, uh, oh, actually here. So, um, and then we can average together as many z-scores as we want. So we can combine these, do averages of these rankings. Um, you could also do weighted averages. So if you say, hey, that Ken Palmer looks really cool, I'm gonna weigh that twice as much as something else. You can calculate z-scores of ratings from one, do that basically, weigh that twice as much as z-scores from another ranking system, and you can kind of create weighting ones based on what you think the best uh, ones would be. I mean, this year, I don't expect you to have any idea how to do this, but maybe after a couple years of doing some of these, you might start to say, oh, weighted average does make sense. I want to weight some of these more than others. So formula real quick, because it's a math thing, I got to give you a formula here. Find the z-score of a specific team. What that means is you take the rating for the team, you're going to subtract the average rating for all the teams. So in one specific rating system, take the rating of a team minus the average of all of them, divided by the standard deviation. Standard deviation tells you how spread out these ratings are. So again, we saw one by being 21 to negative 21 versus 100 to a negative 100. Bigger standard deviations, more spread of data. And to do this, never do this by hand, use Excel or Google Sheets. And so on, on Canvas now, there's I sent you a link uh, for an Excel spreadsheet that will look like this. Um, this very first one, this first tab that says Ink Stats, uh, I, went, I went ahead and uploaded the, the data from the Ink Stats rating system. And so we saw, again, this 19.4 this was the Houston one, Alabama was 19. So then I then calculated what the, the z-score is. So this is the, the formula in Excel. If you've used Excel, uh, maybe you'll recognize a little bit of this. What this F2 represents, so I'm highlighting this one. That F2 represents this. This is the, the data for Houston. And then I'm going to subtract off the average of all of these um, predictive ratings for all of these 363 schools. And then I divide it by the standard deviation of this. One comment with dealing with Excel is that there's no dollar signs around F2, but there's dollar signs around these. The reason that we put dollar signs is because if we copy this formula into the next one, I don't want the averages or the standard deviations to change. So dollar signs around this keeps it from changing, as opposed to F2, if I copy this down to the next one, Excel says, oh, 
that's going to be the equivalent in the next row. So that's going to be taking F3, which is this entry, and then F4, et cetera. So you can easily copy this down, do this calculation. If you have any questions, if you want to try this on your own, please let me know. I'm happy to help you with this. But we can see that roughly Houston is like 2.47-ish, something better than the average, but it's pretty close to some place like Alabama. And then again, we see this slightly bigger jump to some place like UCLA. And you could do this for multiple ratings and then take these z-scores and average them together, and then you can find a new rating new ratings, new ranking systems based on combining all of these different z-scores together. But we like upsets, right? We, this is the, the fun of the NCAA tournament, trying to figure out what some upsets would be. So how can we deal with this question of finding upsets? Because as we look at these computer, these computer rating systems, all of them seem to kind of agree that we have these top teams, these bottom teams, right? Almost no rating system will have 15 seeds or 14 seeds be ranked above a two or three seeds, but yet those upsets are still going to happen. So how can we determine them if our computer rating systems are never going to give us these? So a little historical context. 2022, I became a huge St. Peter's fan because there was a 15 seed. They beat the number two seed, Kentucky. They beat the number three seed, Purdue. They beat the number seven seed, Murray State. We're like, yeah, this is awesome, right? They were, they were a nobody team. Um, but these are the ones that people cheer for. Um, previous year, Number 15 seed, again, Oral Roberts, they beat number two seed Ohio State, which I'm an Ohio State fan, so that was sad, but, um, and then they went ahead and beat number seven seed Florida. Then another one, 14 seed Abilene Christian beat number three seed in Texas. So we have all these upsets that are occurring, so how can we correctly pick every single upset? So if you wanna make sure that you guess every single upset in a tournament, how could you do that? What could you do to guess every single upset in a tournament correctly? Ooh, I wish it was that. I wish it was that fancy. <laughs> what could you do? Standard deviation. Ooh, too fancy again. <laughs> what you do is you just only pick upsets. You say 16 seeds, everybody wins. 15 seeds, everybody wins. 14 seeds, everyone wins. You only pick upsets? And yes, you would have definitely predicted 15 seed Oral Roberts making it to the Sweet 16. You would have picked St. Peter's making it all the way to um, the Elite Eight if you only pick upsets. But obviously your, your bracket will stink if you only pick upsets. So there's kind of the sweet spot that we pick all the upsets correctly by only picking upsets, but we know that's not a good idea. How do we kind of find the sweet spot of, of who, might be, um, who might be worthy of upsets? And this is one thing I want to highlight. This is one difference between picking a bracket that will beat a lot of people and trying to pick a perfect bracket. If you pick too many upsets, chances are you're probably not going to beat a lot of people. But you might increase your chances of picking a perfect bracket because we know the, all of the top seeds always winning never happens. So you have to pick some to get a perfect bracket. But you don't want to pick too many that then it tanks your entire bracket when those upsets don't happen. But we want them, so how do we do it? How do we use some math if it's fun to pick these? So since we don't have any of these systems, these computer ranking systems, how can we create a different model to help us indicate who are some potential Cinderella teams? Who has something in their skill set that lends themselves to maybe being better than the average 14 or 15 seed? And so we're gonna look at what's called the four-factor model for basketball. Um, there's kind of the eight here, but they call it a four-factor model for basketball. So what is this four-factor model? Um, in general, there's four different aspects of basketball that's really helpful to win basketball games. Scoring points. We, we need to score points. Turnovers. You don't want to make turnovers. You want to get rebounds. And the last one is you want to get to the free throw line and make your free throw. So in general, this kind of summarizes the four most important aspects of basketball games. Now, for each of these, though, you can look not only at an offensive aspect of this, but also a defensive aspect of this. And that's why it's called the four-factor model, but really it's eight because you have four for offense and four for defense. So for instance, you want to score lots of points, you don't want the other team to score lots of points. 
you want to get turnovers on defense, but you don't want to give the ball over on offense, et cetera. So you want to make sure that you have both the offensive and the defensive side model with this. So let's look at the offensive four-factor model. So these are some often called like advanced basketball statistics. We have this first one is called the effective field goal percentage. It's the number of field goals made. So a field goal in basketball is just like in a, a shot that you're gonna make that's not a free throw. So either you make three point shots or you make two point shots, these are field goals. So you make a bunch of field goals, but then we add on a little added half a point for every three point shot we make. Why, why do we add on a little half point per or three point shots? What's the difference between a two point and a three point shot? You get a little a half a point extra, right? Because you make a two point shot, you add half of that onto it, you get a three point shot. So we want to weight three point shots to say that makes sense that those are more valuable than two point shots. And we just divide that over the total number of attempts, total number of shots that you have attempted. Um, and then, uh, oh, I want to make a note on this. I'll come back to it. But um, then the turnovers committed per possession, abbreviated uh, sometimes as TPP, turnovers over the number of possessions. Now, possessions is a tricky stat because most teams don't keep track of possessions. It's not a, a common stat that you find in box scores, but you can estimate it down here field goal attempts plus turnovers minus offensive rebounds plus this. By the way, I will upload these slides to Canvas so you can see this afterwards. Um, but you can estimate it um, or find a website that already has estimated it for you. We have the offensive rebounding percentage. This is the number of offensive rebounds divided by offensive rebounds plus opponent defensive rebounds. Why does that make sense? Why, does that a, why is that a fraction that helps us understand how good your offensive rebounding is? As opposed to just saying, look, you score, you have lots of offensive rebounds. You have an average of 28 per game versus 27 per game. Why does that give us a better indicator of how good your rebounding is? What's offensive rebounds plus defensive, uh, opponent defensive rebounds? What does that basically imply that you're calculating? How many rebounds scored? E exactly, right. How many possible rebounds were, were had? So you see how many did you get versus how many your opponents got. You want that to be a pretty big number. And then the free throw rate, it's not just free throws made over free throws attempted. This is free throws made over field goals attempted. What this fraction calculates for us is this says you're getting to the line because you're gonna have a lot of free throws attempted based on your field goal attempts, but you're also making your free throws. So this one takes into account both getting to the free throw line as well as making your free throws. And then we can look at the defensive one. I'll just quickly go through this. There's, again, there's the four just done a little bit differently. You know, you're looking at the first one is the opponent's field goals made versus the opponent's three-point shots. Defensive ones, you're causing turnovers versus your opponent's possessions, et cetera, et cetera. All of these kind of flipped around for what your opponents are going to be making and shooting. So I have a, a link on Canvas then to the next one. This is a, a website called sportsreference.com. This is probably the best place to find statistics to do some statistical analysis for these teams. I've, I've sent you links for both what's called the, the advanced school statistics and the advanced opponent statistics. If we look at the, the schools, the school advanced over here, the, the ones that we're calculating in the four factor model have already been calculated um, for us in this. So we have this like offensive rebounding percentage. This is your turnover percentage. You have your effective field goal percentage. We have these numbers. This is your free throws made over your field goals attempted. So we have these columns for my four factor model for offense. If you look at your advanced opponent stats, you then would take those equivalent columns for your uh, defensive ones. And, if, and again, if, if you want help on any of this, don't hesitate to ask. I'm happy to help show you how you can uh, get this into an Excel file, but you'll, you'll click on this little thing, share and export. You'll export it into Excel file and you can do your Excel magic with that. So with this, we need, we're gonna do a process called linear regression. What linear regression is going to do for us is we're going to try to create some sort of equation that's going to model how all of these are going to help us estimate a winning percentage. So we wanna see how does our winning percentage get based upon these four or eight factors. 
So we create this gigantic equation where my winning percentage is going to be formed by my four offensive ones, my EFE, my TPP, my ORB and FTR. So these are my, my four offensive ones. These are my four defensive ones. And then I have this little constant at the end, this little thing um, that's like a, think about it as like a y-intercept essentially. We're gonna try to figure out what are these coefficients we're going to use Excel to say, what is that A, B, C, D, right? How do each of these factors, how do they impact my winning percentage? We have some gut intuition that the better you shoot the ball, your EFG, that the more winning percentage you get, as opposed to the bigger the, the defensive one is, the better your opponent shoot, the lower your winning percentage will be. So you can do this using a regression feature in the data analysis tool pack. Um, again, I can, I can show this to you if you want to do this on your own. I've uploaded a file that already has done this for you, so I, don't, I won't go into it, but um, there is an Excel file. The, the ink stats one, if you go to the second tab on the bottom, there's a four factor model stats. I've gone through and I've done this for you, at least based on like, through yesterday morning statistics. Um, I have the, the four offensive ones shaded in yellow, the four defensive ones shaded in green, and then I did this process of linear regression to then get an expected win percentage from this four factor. This, this third sheet on, uh, on Excel, you can access that to see um, what the hypothesis testing, all that stuff prints out for you, but it's not necessary. I've already kind of done that work for you. But to summarize that, what, what, I, what we found was that these were the approximate numbers. I've rounded these. They, they go absolutely like 10 decimals, but I rounded these so we can at least see a little bit what intuition do we have on how each of these play a role in our winning percentage. So my, um, don't be swayed by how big or small these numbers are. We're just gonna look at positive negative. Reason is since EFG, TPP, some of these are like small decimals and some of these are whole numbers. Um, we don't wanna look to see how big them, they are, but we see that Something like the, the positive EFG, that the more you shoot, the better you shoot, this is going to increase your win percentage. This is a negative, so this means that the more turnovers you have, this is going to be decreasing because it's negative. So you're gonna have a lower win percentage if you have more turnovers. I suppose the offensive rebounds will go up, better free throw shooting, et cetera. And then we see that since this is a negative, the better your opponents shoot, the worse your win percentage goes. The, the, fewer, possession, the fewer turnovers you cause, your win possession is going to decrease as well, or this, yes, this, uh, this is the, the, how good your defense is, the, the better your opponent, the, I guess, the least, sorry, the less that your opponents turn the ball over, that the worse it's going to be for you. And then we can see again that the better your, the defense is, the better the opponent's rebounding is, the worse your team does, etc. And so if we do this model, these calculations, let's see what are, what does spit out from this? What are some of our top teams? And so if you, if you go to the Excel sheet and you sort by that last column, you can see that Houston becomes number one on this. The numbers inside the parentheses, that's the, the consensus rank on that Massey ratings, that, that giant one that had all the computer rankings. Houston was ranked one on that. This model also gives Houston the advantage. It says that Houston has basically all of the factors that should make a team be really, really good. They can rebound, they can shoot the ball well, they, they don't have a lot of turnovers, et cetera. They have all these things. Tennessee then becomes number two, Gonzaga, UCLA, et cetera. And then someplace like Sam Houston State, it's not even on anybody's radar, they're the 65th best team, but yet somehow they have a lot of these really, really good statistics. And then the same thing, Liberty, if, if Sam Houston State makes the tournament, Liberty makes the tournament, I'll be honest, I'll probably be picking those for a potential upset in some of these. Um, Massachusetts Lowell, I doubt they make the tournament because that's they're probably not very good. But maybe they do. Um, and then again, we can see some of these. We go down to number 12, Alabama, that's ranked two. They at least have some pretty good things um, formed by all of these factors. Now one comment about these factors that's nice about modeling is that there's not really much of an overlap. That if you're really good at shooting the ball, that doesn't guarantee that you're good at rebounding, or that doesn't guarantee that you don't turn the ball over. They all tell a slightly different story in our winning percentage. And that's the power of these eight factors, is that they give us something a little bit different that all together forms me uh, a pretty good model for this. And this is um, back when we talked about some of these upsets. Two years ago, I taught a sports analytics class. 
I had students in that class use this model and they, everybody in the class predicted that that 15 seed um, Oral Roberts beating Ohio State, everybody had that in their, in their brackets and then they also had them beating the, the number seven seed after that. Um, was that, I think Florida. So everybody had the 15 seed because that 15 seed of Will Roberts that year had a very high substantial, um, they had this uh, four factor model, expectation was pretty high. So it, it has worked in the past to help do upsets. Last year it stunk to be honest, man, I, oof, it was a rough year. But, um, but sometimes, you know, like all of this is not perfect, but they give you some insight that can be useful. So then just highlight a few more calculations that you could do. Um, this doesn't take into account strength of schedule, how good your opponents are. This just looks solely at your statistics. So you could do some modifications to this winning percentage to account for strength of schedule. And that Excel spreadsheet I gave you, I saved the column that gives you strength of schedule. So why not you do things with multiplication, addition, whatever, you can modify that winning percentage to say, well, yeah, these teams didn't play anybody good, so they're gonna look really, really good on the stat sheet. Um, you could also do z-scores with this as well, combine this with computer rating systems and create this mega model that takes into account everything. Um, I've, done that, I've, I've done that in the past and I like that because it gives a realistic expectation of some of these teams that are potential Cinderella teams. And then the last one I wanted to mention was the computer simulations. If you know computer programming, you could create what's called a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, you take the statistics of two teams and then you create a computer program that then says, they face each other, let's model each possession and see what's the likelihood that certain outcomes are gonna take place based on your team statistics. We use randomization in this and we simulate a game being played thousands or millions of times. So Ohio State maybe plays Michigan a million times. We could then calculate some probability of these two teams after this. So if Ohio State wins 75% of the games of the million simulations, we'd say that the probability of Ohio State beating Michigan would be 75%. And so we could have some probabilities for this. Um, Monte Carlo simulations are really good to have some, some randomness and not just have absolute certainty that, um, in our models. And you could also do this to model upsets to just simulate a single game, because that's what the tournament is. You just get one shot, and hopefully you just pull out the win. You could have your simulation model that as well. Um, most likely the better team should win, but that one game might have the, the not better team end up losing. So a few last reminders as I wrap up this talk here. Um, everything from this presentation is wrong. Um, you, if you follow this exactly, you will never have a perfect bracket. You will still have some things that go wrong. But again, the goal is that this is going to be helpful, but everything indeed has some sort of um, imperfections in these models. If they were perfect, if everything we talked about was perfect, then perfect brackets would have already been made by now. These computer rating systems print out these things every year, people would have already had plenty of perfect brackets. Um, the unfortunate part about sports is that the better team does not always win. Um, sometimes you do have the not better team ends up winning. Maybe on that given day you're like, that is the better team. But in general, a team might win 99% of the games versus the other team, but in that one specific day, that underdog takes the better. Um, also, beware of the cat bracket. Uh, I attended a, a math conference many years ago on this, this discussion of using math modeling to model the NCAA tournament, and at the end, they told us that we did this, but the cat bracket won. They're like, what, what's the cat bracket? And they're like, well, what you do is you look at the mascot. If the mascot's a cat, you win. <laughs> if the mascot is something that a cat likes, then yeah, you can let that win as long as it's not facing a cat. If it's something that a cat hates, they definitely lose. So things like dogs, pff, dogs will lose first round every time. The cats will win. Things like birds, cats like birds because they eat birds. So birds will also progress decently far until they face a cat and the cat will eat them. And so you can create these like mascot brackets and the cat bracket beat the best mathematical model that year. Um, so, so be aware, you get all sorts of weird ones. You can do an apex predator one. How you do weird uh, ones and sometimes you get lucky, um, but just be aware that's that happens. Um, and also, I will I will be forming an ESPN group for you to form for us to do March Madness tournaments. Um, if you want to compete, um, use some of these things to form a, a bracket yourself. So there we go. So any any questions at all? If, if you do have questions, definitely don't hesitate to send me an email over break. Uh, the first round starts uh, next Thursday. Um, that's when all of your brackets are, your, have to be submitted by. Like I said, I'll form an ESPN group once Selection Sunday happens. 
And yeah, if you have questions on the computations, you want to know more about this, that was 50 minutes of super speed information. We could talk about this for hours, so definitely let me know what you do. But thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your day.